And it's a pleasure uh, to have all of you all here today. Uh, we're going to have Guy Cipriano from Golf Course Industry to moderate the session. So, uh, Guy, we'll turn it over to you. Kyle, thanks for having us, and thanks to the panelists for doing this. Speaking in front of your colleagues isn't the easiest thing sometimes, so we'll, we'll make this uh, easy on you, and this is a great group. And I think we have every variety of warm weather grass represented here on the, the panel, so we're going to have a great discussion. And before we get going, there's a Twitter contest, so please share one thing you learned from today's panel session on Twitter using hashtag BASF Groundbreakers and hashtag GIS2020 for a chance to win a pair of Costa sunglasses. Two winners will be selected randomly this evening and notified via Twitter. So the first thing we want to get into here is just describe the golf course each of you work at and the path you took to your current job. Well, good afternoon, Nick Kearns, the Oaks Club. So we're a 36 hole facility in uh, Osprey, which is just south of Sarasota. Uh, one of the unique features of our property is, is one course is uh, Supreme Pass Palum and the other one is uh, Bermuda Grass. So we got, uh, we got a lot of different uh, techniques and uh, products that we have to kind of zig and zag around with, uh, with the different issues that we come across. But uh, been there for seven years and uh, was at the Ritz Carlton before that. So I've been, been in the warm season area for a little over 14 years now. Tom Callinger, I'm at Forest Glen Golf and Country Club in Naples, Florida. My golf course is Seashore Pass Palom. Um, we had, did a renovation 12 years ago and converted to Pass Palom. I have been at my club for seven, 16 and a half years. Robert Kilduff, I'm right here in Orlando, Florida at Disney World. We've got 63 holes of golf. Uh, Originally from Virginia, went to Virginia Tech, uh, been as far north, cool season at Bethpage up in New York on Long Island, and then spent about seven years in Hilton Head, South Carolina at the Sea Pines Resort before moving to Florida about seven years ago. Uh, I'm Charles Aubrey. I'm the superintendent at Eastlake Golf Club. Um, it's in Atlanta, Georgia. We have many Verde Ultra Score from Unigrass Greens. We have Myers Zoysia Grass in our fairways. Uh, variety of Zoysias all throughout our tee boxes. Um, I was kind of a turf grass nomad <laughs> until I got to Atlanta eight years ago. I uh, worked in Arizona, I worked in Idaho, um, grew up in Michigan. And uh, for those of you who don't know, we, we do host a tour championship every year. Uh, we also host the Eastlake Cup in October every year. Chris Ortmeyer, uh, Director of Agronomy at Champions Golf Club in Houston, Texas. Um, 36 hole facility, private facility, um, founded and owned still by Jackie Burke Jr., uh, 1956 PGA champion and Masters champion. Um, came to Champions by way of several years at Colonial Country Club up in Fort Worth, Texas. So, um, Champions is uh, it's all Bermuda grass, 419 and TIFF Sport, uh, as well as TIFF Eagle Greens on both golf courses. Uh, something unique about Champions is, uh, I guess, the Cypress course, the tournament course is. Uh, about four and a half acres of greens, so 220,000 square feet. Chris is being pretty modest here. His club is hosting a huge event this year. Why don't you tell the audience about what you have coming up in June? Yeah, thanks, Guy. Looking forward to it. We're hosting the uh, U.S. Women's Open this June, so uh, very excited. It's been, geez, feels like four years in the making now, so uh, we're, we're pumped to have them down and uh, see what they can do. This is for each of you. How would you describe the growing environment at your golf course and what are some disease concerns that you have to be on the lookout for? Yeah, at our facility, we're, we're literally a quarter of the mile, uh, actually probably more of an eighth of a mile from the, from the Gulf of Mexico. So you got, with the past palum, you got a plethora of uh, disease problems, leaf spot, dollar spot, large patch. Um, so and we do battle the same diseases on the Bermuda grass, but again, it's uh, much easier to control and uh, the longevity, the res the residual that we get out of the products uh, tends to tends to last a little bit longer on the Bermuda grass versus the uh, past palum. So, and I'm sure uh, Tom over here will tell you the uh, quantity of, of fungicides that uh, that we end up using is not ideal, but it's what we have to do in order to keep the turf healthy. So, on the same note, down in Naples, um, our summers are pretty wet. We average between 70 and 100 inches of rain. So you guys can just imagine what the disease pressures we have. Um, same as Nick, I have the exact same disease pressure as Nick. Um, another thing is during the summer months, weeds are very tough to control and pass palum. 
So that's, you know, it, like Nick says, it's a tough environment. All right, I'm right here in Orlando, and uh, we've got uh, nine holes of Platinum Pass Palum and the rest of it's Tiff Eagle. A lot of the Tiff Eagles are uh, older for sure. Uh, we get a lot of days like this, overcast out. Uh, winters can be a little cool at times, and then the sun comes back out when we can actually grow some grass. But we do the majority of our rounds this time of year when the grass is not you know, actively growing as much as you would like. So for us, it's a pretty broad spectrum of diseases that we could get here. Um, and what we try to do pretty much is protect the plants as, as much as we possibly can to handle the 60,000 rounds a year that we're getting on, you know, the 18 hole golf courses. So pretty unique environment and uh, not quite as much wind that you would get, you know, on the coast uh, to get some good air movement. So we can definitely get some wet weather in the winter and then some super wet weather, you know, in the summertime. All right. So I'm in Atlanta and it does tend to get pretty hot there in the summertime. Um, you know, we're usually uh, 45 to 60 days over 90 uh, at least 60 days typically where we don't drop below 70 at night humidity is really high especially in the summer months July August even the first part of September um, in the winter time we tend to be pretty wet we have almost eight inches of rain so far in January uh, it's cooler right now we're about 50 we dropped to about 30 35 at night uh, one of the difficult parts that we have is our ultra dwarf management on our greens in the winter uh, mostly because we want to see a lot of sunlight. We don't get a lot of sunlight when we get a lot of rain, and we have a, a tendency to get a lot of rain in the wintertime. Uh, it's a really conducive environment for disease development those times of year, and our warm season turf really doesn't have the ability to grow out of problems because even though it's not totally dormant, it just kind of sits there. It doesn't really move. Yeah, so pretty much everything y'all just said. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so technically, I guess Houston's classified as a humid subtropical climate, um, but, but again, tons of rain. I think the average, historical average will tell you 50 inches a year, but we've had 65, 70 in the last four years. Um, a lot of cloudy, you know, cloudy days where we don't, the, the literally, if you didn't mow them, the greens would stay wet all day long. So uh, pretty much a Petri dish uh, down there in Houston. Okay, I'm going to put Charles on the spot here. Charles, how does having the Turch Championship each August affect your uh, fungicide applications and it changed from September to August last year? How has that altered your program, if at all? I mean, having the tournament, our entire program is based around our tournament. So, you know, we start from the Tour Championship and we build out our agronomic program working backwards every single year um, to right now, basically. And... Uh, you know, the change from September to August, you know, we're pretty much spraying for the same things um, that we always were in the same time periods, whether we have the tournament or not. We do a little bit more spraying lead into tournament, but uh, overall, the, the, what we spray and how we spray isn't too affected too much by the tournament. You know, we have our program and we're going to stick to it, but uh, we definitely do up it a little bit leading into tournament to make sure we're covered with the amount of damage we're going to be doing to the plant with the excessive mowing and rolling that's occurring to it. And how about you, Chris? Will having a major championship in June af affect your, your spray program this year? And if so, in what ways? Yeah, I mean, even going into the fall, like Charlie was saying, being that we're, we're uh, Bermuda grass, but we, we pretty much shut down in the winter, you know, any wounds that we have this time of year are going to be present on into early June. So I uh, really want to make sure we're as clean as possible. Anytime you have a nationally televised event, you want to make sure you're showing well on TV. So, uh, and then same thing with all the uh, mechanical stress that we'll induce throughout the, the week of the championship. We've got to make sure the plant's as healthy as possible and protected. Tom, how closely do you follow the introduction of new solutions to the golf market, and what factors do you consider when implementing something such as Maxtima or Navicon intrinsic to your existing program? Well, for the people that know me, I don't like to be the guinea pig. So, I don't think any superintendent does. So I might let Nick try it up there and then tell me how it works. Um, with the amount of spraying we do on the pass pail and throughout the year, it's pretty important, as I would say. And finding newer uh, chemicals and newer technology, um, you have to be able to trust that the scientists did all the work on it and it's going to work on your course. Um, we spray our we spray our greens 
50, we spray our grains every week with some kind of fungicide and we do what I do, I call it, it's layering my fungicides with certain diseases, timing of the year, such, you know, leaf spots big for us in the month of November and December, large patch starts showing up then because we're going through the weather change. So we're on a serious preventative program during those months because our heavy play starts January 1 and we'll do about 260 rounds a day from January to the end of March. Nick, how do you feel about being the guinea pig for Tom? Well, it's a good thing I like him, I guess. But uh, no, it's a, you know, technology is a, is a big part of what, what we have to deal with. And uh, whether it's fungicides or even the, the mechanical side of things, it's a, it's a big part of what we do. And, uh, you know, finding fungicides that have a longer residual, that, that give us better control, longer control, uh, is, is definitely something, you know, the price point, it, if it dictates that, you're going to get longer control. It's certainly something that uh, that is attractive. It's something that I pay close attention to. One of the things I price point sometimes with me is not as important as what the product can do. I don't mind putting out a sixteen hundred dollar app or a fifteen thousand dollar app wall to wall sixty acres if I know we're going to get longevity and we're going to get the control that we need. Robert, you manage a few different golf courses, right? What goes into your methodology when uh, deciding to implement something new to your spray program? No, that's, yeah, that's a great question. The way I really look at it is we've got so many different holes of golf out there that were built at different times. And all of a sudden you just have different disease pressures that are going to pop up on, on them. And never in the past have I really ever had any fairy ring issues. There's some great products, great uh, preventative programs to be on. But this is the first year, you know, in my career that I've actually had some rings pop up. And thankfully, not a lot. We had about six greens that had one or two rings on them. And they weren't huge or, you know, didn't really cause too much effect on golf. But we couldn't get control. You know, we were taking all the products that were out there, uh, making additional apps, uh, trying to get some cure from it. And we just weren't seeing it. So luckily enough, we've got a great relationship with BASF. The rep is always out, uh, feels, you know, he comes by, he lives close by, but he's been very good to us at supporting us and supporting our needs. And he came to us with an opportunity to do some trial work with these new products. And they brought the tech guys out, made some applications throughout the summer. I mean, we're summertime in Orlando, it is hot as can be, and we're making these apps. And they told us straight up, he said, obviously you've got the rings, you know, they're pretty severe. It's going to take a little bit of time, but by the time we made second applications, you know, 45 days after the initial app, we're seeing a lot of recovery and growth. And for me, just being, you know, the opportunity to try some of these new products out there is definitely worth it because you don't ever know when you might have a problem where something that has worked in the past might not work anymore. So I think it's, uh, we have just, we just have a, a huge number of holes out there with a lot of different uh, growing environments where, you know, diseases are going to pop up and, you know, I think it's, you just never know what you're going to get. Charles, what does it mean to somebody in your situation to have a new DMA, DMI available like came on the market last year from BASF? I mean, I think it means a lot. It gives us an opportunity to throw another mode of action into, you know, our fungicide rotation that we're not using in Atlanta for probably four, at least four or five months, we're trying to stay away from it. Um, it's non-growth inhibiting, it covers a really wide spectrum of diseases as well. Um, I, I, would, I mean, I'll just tell you, I was, I was the total opposite of Tom. I've, I'm, I was the guinea pig and looking back, maybe it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but the first time I ever sprayed an Avicon on the greens was five days before the tour championship. Um, but I had a lot of confidence in it, and I had spoken a lot with Mr. Mike over there and gave me a lot of reassurance on, on what we were going to see out of it. And you know, we were able to throw a contact in with a DMI and then also have a qual. You know, that you got three different mode of actions going out before your biggest tournament of the year. You're going to cover your bases pretty well. So to me, it, it means a lot. We all saw it on t TV, Charles. But in your own words, how did it perform? Uh, great. You know, yeah. a few years in the past, when I first got there, um, I've been at Eastlake for five years now. Uh, the first couple turn tournaments we had, we started seeing some large patch popping up in the greens midweek, and we'd have to go out and make curative applications. Um, that worked really well. We obviously weren't using Maxima or 
using Navicon at the time, but you know, we've gotten through the last couple of tournaments. Um, we put out Lexicon this year. We put out Navicon, um, and we've gotten through them with nothing. So it's worked really well. I got a question for you guys. How many guys before you verify spray Lexicon? We've sprayed Lexicon before, before we verify, but then also, uh, you know, various other strobes or something to help aid in recovery and then avoid any kind of setbacks. I've actually recovery. seen our greens recover quicker after, and when I verify my greens, we go three quarter inch, eight inches deep, and we do it double. And I've watched them when I didn't do the Lexicon prior, came up. They they healed about nine days to twelve days quicker than they did before, and. If you think about it, I'm making the green Swiss cheese in the summer by doing that. Yeah, I've heard that a lot. You know, people spraying products with um, Insignia and I'm basically getting a lot of that recovery when they spray prior to their aeration. I, we tend to save Lexicon and Navicon for our take-all applications in the fall as well as, you know, one of our first SDS applications. So we're kind of out of aerification season at that point. But, but we actually, you know what, we do do a small quarter right after the tournament. So... I can't necessarily say I've seen faster recovery from it, but maybe it's something I'll look for. Nick, we had a great conversation this morning with some university researchers about fungicide resistance. How big of an issue is it in Naples? How closely do you follow fungicide resistance issues, and what are your concerns with that? It, it's a huge concern, quite honestly, and uh, it's and you'd be to be a guinea pig or be a test site. Again, it's uh, I'm I'm one to to do that. I'm not afraid of it. Uh, again, I've built up a real good re relationship with a lot of the reps. Um, but yeah, with, when we're dealing with dollar spot, leaf spot, and you start to see certain products maybe not controlling it as well or as long, it certainly uh, it's, it's, it's makes you think about it for sure. So, but again, it's I'm not one to, to I'm not one to be afraid of, of trying new products. Chris, what concerns are there with fungicide resistance down in Houston? Yeah, I think fungicide resistance is one of those tough things because I don't know that you can ever say for sure whether you've got it or how hard it would be to, to see it versus herbicide resistance or, or, or some of those other ones where you can visually see the escapes. But if you're going to be a responsible manager, you definitely need to make sure you're doing your part. I mean, just like antibiotics with your kids, you don't want to use them unless you have to, um, you know, because you don't want to develop resistance to it. And then all of a sudden you don't have the tools that you need when you need them. So... It's something that I'm definitely aware of, and I look at every time I try to develop my program and any time I'm filling the tank, it's in the back of my mind. Robert, how rewarding is it when you add something new to your program? It works, and thousands upon thousands of customers have an enjoyable golf experience. How fulfilling and rewarding it is it to see it all come together like that? No, it, it is really rewarding. And just like I said earlier, the difference for us this year is we were struggling with just a few rings, but something that we could not get under control with all the other products that were out there that have worked for me in the past when something would pop up. So to have physically go out there, see these things change in front of your eyes over you know, 30, 45 days, and to say, hey, you know, if I had had a bigger problem than this, you know, what a great feeling that is to see, you know, your turf turn around. Because, you know, I don't know where we would be with those, you know, those rings would probably still be there. Hopefully they would have grown out of it at some point. But we were, like I said, we're using pretty much every other product out there and not seeing a lot of recovery. So to see a new product like this come out and to see it, you know, physically work on these eight, you know, these eight rings that we had out there was, was definitely very rewarding. Yeah, Nick, how awesome is it when you see that what you tried worked and your members who are down there from for the winter have an awesome golf experience? What, is, what does that mean for you? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, when you start getting the compliments and, and they enjoy the round and you, even from their guests that they bring in, it's, it's very rewarding. And one of the products that we use last year that we've, we still use is uh, Exemplar. Dollar Spot was a huge problem. We've tried, we've tried using some chlorothanol products and, and, and such, but last year we did the, the Exemplar. And uh, the, the longevity that we got out of that product really helped us get through the season. Uh, again, you don't want to have a spray rig out there all the time doing that. It's a lot of time and labor that goes into that. So, again, when, when you're getting good quality uh, turf grass and you're getting good control from a product like Exemplar, it certainly uh, is something that you keep in the toolbox. That's probably one of what you said, Nick. Getting dollar spot in the month of January 
with all the play you get, there's no bounce back right away. So having the preventative program and using exemplar is something we've done too in the past and I have not seen dollar spot in January in a long time or February. Charles, how about you? Um, your big events in August though, but how rewarding is it to see everything come together, not only for that, but, but for, for your members that are there all the time? Yeah, I mean, it, <clears throat> it's extremely rewarding, right? I mean, I, like he was talking, we all spent a lot of time in developing our, our decisions and our strategy, and we're constantly thinking about, like you're saying, what was the last thing I went in the tank? What's the next thing that's going in the tank? What's going in after? What's the weather doing? When do I want to get this spray out? Am I going to change it to this day? Am I going to change it to that day? And um, when you put a plan together and it all works out, it's kind of like, a, all right, awesome. It was great. Now we're always like, what's next, right? But, you know, those little gains and when things do come together and work out fantastically, like for the Tour Championship, I mean, I think that's why we're all in it. Chris, how much is putting together an agronomic plan and program and a spray program, a team effort at Champions? Do you involve your assistants a lot? And what do you do about, to educate them about some of the things we're talking about here, here right now? I try to as much as possible, yeah. but I, I don't know, you know, the guy I learned underneath, he was always the one in the, in the chem building filling up the tank. And that, that's kind of something that I've taken with me, right, wrong or indifferent. I feel like it helps keep me engaged with what's going on in the golf course if I'm the one in there. Uh, so definitely something I want to do to help educate our assistants and, and uh, get them more exposure to what we're doing, why we're doing it, and all those kind of things. So I try to make a conscious effort when I can to involve them in that. Um, most of the program building is, is kind of on my shoulders. Is that the case for all of you, or is it a, a group effort at any of your facilities? It, it, for us, it's more of a group effort because, uh, again, I, I can't be uh, around all the courses. So i got two of my assistants over here that I rely heavily on them, uh, the superintendent. Uh, and again, we have a weekly manager's meeting, always kind of chatting about what we're seeing, what they're, what, they're, what they're out there seeing, what I see when I'm driving around. Uh, so, again, it's, uh, it's a team effort for sure on our end. And, again, but it, that, still we, we have time where we sit down and, and map it out weekly, but it, also monthly and kind of moving forward in what we've seen in scouting reports. So. I agree with Nick. Mine's a real team effort. I rely on my two assistants. Both my, one of my assistants has been with me 11 years. The other has been with seven. So they're seeing a little bit more with the products than I am. And I trust their opinion. And they'll come in and tell me, hey, we got to switch up. Something's not working here. Um, I'm not like Chris going in the chemical room. They don't allow me in there. <laughs> so... But it is a team effort at my club. And like you said, we have weekly staff meetings. We talk about the next spray, what we're going to do two weeks after that, where we are going into summer. And it's even the opposite go or the same going into season. We're in October. We're thinking about Thanksgiving, January 1, talking about let's get the rotation right with the spray and let's not get caught with our pants down because we screwed up the rotation or we used a product that didn't work. How about you, Robert? Are you allowed to go into the uh, chemical room? I do. I do get in there on occasion, but, uh, you know, I think that's just part of the development. We've got a lot of people. Uh, we've got 45 holes out of one maintenance facility, so there's spray rigs going out every day. Uh, we've got superintendents that work there, but it gives everybody a chance to have some responsibility. Uh, we're starting to bring technology in by getting some uh, different chemical tracking systems that we can are all cloud-based so we can look up our sprays on our phones while you're out in the field or while you're ever in the chemical building. Um, and it's just part of, I think, for us is what we're doing. We're, we are a neat property. We're a big property. There are a lot of young people in there because we have a lot of holes to golf. But hopefully we can get these younger guys up to where, you know, they can move on to be assistants or superintendents at other facilities. And that's really what we're trying to do is give them opportunities that I had when I was younger and hopefully have them take on some of these things and go to other clubs where they can learn a bit more too. That's the beauty of the answer that everyone just gave. There are so many different ways to get up to awesome and nobody has to do it the same way in this business. And speaking of awesome, We'll go right down the line here. What would be an awesome 2020 for you at your facility, for each one of you? We got a couple different projects going on. So we got a bunker renovation. We we're doing a practice facility, putting some uh, new croquet court in. So those are, those are some exciting things. Um, you know, the membership gets super excited when they see 
some dirt work going on and uh, again the amenity side of it um, so that's certainly something that's uh, that is, that's exciting from the club standpoint uh, you know looking forward you know the tournaments that we have in March in Florida it kind of gets a good hype going in, in March with uh, with all the tournaments that, that come around and uh, really kind of builds builds the golf aspect in Florida up uh, around that March time frame with all the great events that we do host for me it's going to be we're uh getting ready to renovate our golf course in four years and it's starting to put the plan together this summer um for me it's this summer we're going to do a lot of mapping of our drainage where we have wet areas and we're to really concentrate so when we renovate we over drain these areas solve the minimal problems we have and that's for me in 220 and just keep grass growing yeah, I think for us, we've actually got some uh, exciting new equipment in. We've got some deep time machines, uh, so hopefully we're going to get some extra verification dates. Really try and help these older turfs that we've got out there, uh, improve drainage, uh, infiltration, all that that we really need. Um, you know, we have nematode problems. We've got poor soils and affluent water, so it's not necessarily the best combination, but we've, we're really looking forward to really getting in there, tearing them up some, uh, and really trying to make a change to handle the number of rounds that we have every year I mean from our standpoint I think I think if we can get full staff it'd be it'd be huge for us um, you know 2019 was a rough year for our team and we made it through and we were able to, to present the product that we did and kudos to our team for being able to do that but you know if we can if we can get our staffing levels up I think we're in a really good place we kind of restructured our management team this year have everybody in a really good spot and uh we can just back it up with a full crew. I mean, we'll be guns blazing and I'm really looking forward to what that could be this year. If you find out the secret to fill your crew, I've been short four guys for a year. Tell me. Yeah, we, we can all echo that, I'm sure. Um, I think for us, uh, as I mentioned earlier with the Women's Open, uh, you know, the successful preparation of, execution, and then recovery from would be, would be a huge plus. And I guess uh, starting a water uh, fluent conversion to a fluent water project next fall. So definitely looking forward to that. It's been something that's been three years in the making now. So a couple of big projects, but but hopefully come back here this time next year and you know be a be a better boss, be a better grass grower, and a better friend. So well, I'll do a, a recruiting pitch for all five of you. We have five awesome superintendents and director of agronomies here. So if there's any young person walking around the show floor that wants a good experience. You know, see, see one of these guys. They're truly leaders in the uh, industry, and we thank them for taking the time to join the panel. It was an awesome discussion. And one last thing, we're going to just remind everybody, please share one thing you learned from this session on Twitter using hashtag BASF Groundbreakers and hashtag GIS 2020 for a chance to win a pair of Costa sunglasses, which those would come in handy in any of the places where these superintendents work. And then two winners will be randomly selected this evening and notified via Twitter. So thanks for everybody for showing up. And thanks for the five of you for joining the panel. Yeah, thanks, guys.